I'm happy to introduce our following speakers, uh, Jim Kopman, who's a professor emeritus of epidemiology and an expert on infection disease transmission, and Carl Simon, who's a professor emeritus of mathematics, complex systems, economics, and of public policy. And his research is centered on the theory and applications of dynamical systems. They were both happily, as I said, emeritus and retired, but and longtime colleagues but they were pulled out of, the re of retirement by this pandemic. And today they will talk about some of the work they've been doing during this past year. So please take it away. Oh, thank you very, very much, Mariana. So I'm going to present the mathematical model we've designed to understand better the dynamics and possible interventions in coronavirus epidemics. I'll describe the compartments and dynamics of the mathematical model, then Jim Copeman will discuss the nuances of the model and implications for interventions, especially uh, relative to vaccination in, uh, decisions. So to capture the essence of coronavirus, the model includes different strains, possibly some more contagious than others, uh, mutation, in particular immunity escaping mutations, cross immunity, waning of immunity, and therefore possible reinfection and vaccination uh, possibilities. All key elements of the current pandemic, but we know no model that incorporates all these, in particular the uh, uh, waning and drifting. So it's a comp SIR compartmental model. There are basically three kinds of compartments. These never infected uh, susceptibles, uh, if you're infected with strain J, you're in compartment IJ with J equals zero den denoting the initial strain. And once you're recovered and from strain J and no longer infective, you move to compartment RJ zero, where the second index indicates the level of waning of immunity fr from strain J. So zero is complete immunity. And as it wanes, you move from RJ one to RJ two, et cetera. Key, part, key piece is the set of possible strains, which we think of as the nodes of a network with two strains uh, connected by an edge in a network. If there's a possible, one can mutate to the other. So far, we've looked at three different networks. Uh, we're gonna focus and our interest is moving more and more to the, the, uh, the uh, what we call the independent allele network. Um, so because mutation is so important, we need to have some, some rules, some uh, stipulations of how it works. So when an IH infects an RJK, there's a probability that the new infections, uh, that H will mutate to an H prime. That gives us a M by M by M drift matrix with some uh, restrictions. So first of all, H and H prime have to be connected by an edge in the strain network. And secondly, since we're focusing on immunity escaping mutations, drifting to strain H prime cannot occur if prior infection by strain J entails some immunity to strain H prime. The, uh, so to the dynamics, to the transitions in the model, the key transition is of course transmission. So we're letting BH indicate the transmission probability when an IH encounters a never infected susceptible S. A little more complicated when an IH meets someone recovered from a strain J. There we have to modify the, the transmission probability by both the uh, waning factor K and how far apart H and J are in uh, the uh, strain space, but basically how the, the, the cross immunity levels. So in all these models, uh, the, the first wave is sort of, uh, nothing happened, much happens in the first wave. It's always dominated by the initial strain zero. Uh, vaccination, this model occurs at the, close to the end of this, of the first wave. And for, in this model, we're gonna simply assume that uh, vaccinating someone who's susceptible moves them to I00, so they have at least temporary but complete immunity to strain zero. The dynamics for the other parameters are pretty straightforward, linear. The uh, uh, infectives increase by more infection or by losing infection, the Rs increase in the same way. 
And we put all these together to, in the standard SIR model that we teach in our undergraduate uh, um, modeling classes. So what we care about, what's the outcome of this? In particular, for different values and different changes in the drift rate D and the waning rate W, um, how does the model behave? And, and, and I'm gonna just in a short time focus on the waning rate W, which may be the most important. Waning makes a difference. No waning, no epidemic. So these red, you know, if there's no waning, independent of the drifting, you get these red uh, peaks uh, where the second wave occurs, uh, you know, 80 years later. Similarly, if, if there's no drifting and small waning, very similar non-epidemic behavior. But put the two together and we get the, uh, the interaction leads to the kind of uh, epidemic pandemic we're experiencing right now. So they're, they're important and, and their, their interactions are crucial. How, do, uh, how does the behavior of the model depend on, on levels of waning? So if waning is small, in this case, 10 to minus third, we get these discrete waves of, uh, of infection with uh, the infection more or less dying out in between. The first wave, of course, is, is the initial, dominated by the initial strain zero. Turns out the second wave is dominated by the strain furthest away from the initial strain in, in, in the uh, network, um, the one with the, with the, with the uh, uh, least cross immunity. The third wave back to strain zero, the fourth wave back to the uh, distant strain seven. In, in, in the model case. If, weight, if the waning increases a little bit from the small value, the uh, time to between waves shortens, the size of waves grows, of, of the infection grows. But if waning moves up a little bit, very different behavior. Now, no longer the uh, infection die off in between waves and prevalence moves very quickly to an endemic level. The vaccination, it also depends heavily on waning. If uh, waning is large, in this case, uh, in this run, 0.1, the weight rate of waning, then you can see that uh, prevalence for uh, uh, full vaccination is much lower than prevalence for no vaccination. But if waning is uh, small so that you, you retain your immune status longer, then there are cases in which vaccination can backfire and the prevalence under vaccination can be higher than that without vaccination. And finally, uh, what about uh, uh, differentiated uh, uh, contagiousness? So uh, if we increase the contagious a little bit, say in strain one, we move from the blue to the red, of course, more prevalence means, uh, more, uh, more contagiousness means higher prevalence. But interestingly, as we're seeing in Michigan, the, uh, the more contagious strain completely dominates uh, the epidemic. Jim? Okay, thank you, Carl. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, the vaccine decisions that have to be made. Right now, the, the two major suppliers of the uh, messenger RNA uh, uh, vaccines are already planning to uh, uh, adjust their vaccines for uh, um, the escape mutations that have occurred. Uh, uh, when Carl and I started doing this modeling, uh, there were no escape mutations. Uh, 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 the only mutations at that time were, were enhancing the kind of mutation that uh, Carl illustrated in his last slide. Uh, uh, and so, so people, when, the, when they started to occur, people started thinking, well, sh is this gonna be like influenza? Do we have to have uh, uh, modifications of the strains for influenza every, every year? But uh, uh, this virus is not like influenza. This virus has this uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase which is a, 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 a proofreading mechanism that a, a, a keeps errors from happening. So if, if you then look at the, at the per cell infection mutation rate for the, uh, uh, on the left side there, uh, uh, the, the, that 
rate is much, much lower for this virus than it is for the, the influenza. And another big difference with the influenza is that the uh, uh, infection bottleneck, the, the total number of viruses that are transmitted from one person to another person is much, much less for, for, uh, for this virus. Uh, all of these things make uh, a big difference. If you think about the evolution of this uh, 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 virus, it has adapted over uh, uh, millions and millions of years uh, uh, to jump from one species to another species. It had this, this complex uh, uh, structure, which occupies more than, than, uh, than all, almost two thirds of the genome. That's why this, this uh, uh, virus is, has three times as much genome as the influenza. Uh, uh, and uh, it, 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 it's this and, and, and 16 other things. So there's a lot of evolution that has gone on to, to uh, uh, make this uh, uh, virus adaptable to, the, to different situations and especially to, to reinfection. Uh, uh, Josh, in epidemiology, just uh, uh, you know, published a paper that the the reinfection time of the the endemic coronavirus is is, is you know between one and a half and, and three years, and and, and that's all. Uh, uh, and and we can expect something similar here. So so we haven't seen a lot of the escape mutations uh, 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 yet because we haven't had this big period of reinfections. We're still in the period of first infections, and uh, uh, but but we're going to enter an era where there's much more. But even so, we've got five or six uh, 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 mutations that we have to worry about specifically for escaping uh, uh, immunity, and and that's going to influence what's going to happen on the. Um, uh, the, the Carl, you, you're on my last slide. Uh, are you? Uh, can you can you go back to the first slide? To the first, yeah. yeah there we are. Yeah. So 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 the the the, the way that uh, 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 there are three different kinds of, of mutations that are occurring. There are this escape mutations that are escaping the immunity that somebody has. We have those that increase the transmission rate, and we have founder effects that don't have as, as, as much uh, to do. The, the, the way the influenza does is, is, is they, they, they take all the information, uh, of, of the sequences, and have a very simple epidemiologic model and, in, in order to, to make that decision. And now we can go to the next slide. Uh, uh, no, forward, <laughs> not backward. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, there we go. So, 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 uh, uh, what what we advocate now is, and and what we think is going to be very uh, uh, useful and a powerful way of doing this. But as, as Carl mentioned, no one else is is a model that, that can do this the, the way we have. In order to make the the right choice of the vaccines. You know, I said we have five or six uh, escape mutations to, to choose from. I expect that, that we will have 50 or 60 uh, uh, in not too long of a period. They will not be as strongly uh, escape mutations, but their cumulative effects could be very important. And so making the decision is, is going to, is, we're, we're advocating this uh, approach called decision uh, 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 robustness and identifiability analysis to help make this decision. One thing that happens in, in the mutation, if you have a, an escape mutation that's on the spike protein uh, uh, and interacts with the ACE2 receptor, it, it generally also decreases the transmission rate. And we haven't seen any of these yet, but they will start uh, uh, appearing. Uh, 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 what we advocate is, is making these decisions on the basis of the model, using all of this kind of information, the, the, the talks we heard at the beginning of this session, where, where using artificial intelligence are gonna be very important for, for, for uh, in, in, uh, improving these kinds of decisions. 
one of the real advantages of this model is that that we have a, a, a um, it generates the data from uh, cross neutralization so that we can use it at data on cross neutralization, not just as an input from the laboratory to make the decision, but as an input into the model, which is going to make that much more useful and, and powerful. Uh, 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 going to the next slide. The last slide. Now, the, the uh, one thing about the cross neutralization data is, is that uh, even, even though the, the government's supporting it very well, it's uh, expensive and difficult uh, operation to un un undertake. The influenza surveillance system ac across the world is, is about a $10 billion a year operation. And, and this would be in, in even more than a $10 billion a year uh, operation. There's been a recent advance uh, uh, getting CD8 positive T cells. Now this is, requires using plasma instead of sera, and, and I thought this would be unrealistic, but it really looks realistic. There's this, this uh, new company in, in uh, Seattle that's, that's getting this going. And, and here right now, the, 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 uh, thinking about the model before we have this kind of data, we're, we're thinking about the model, well, it's just going to be an elaboration of the kind of model that, that Carl just presented with about 10 or 12 different uh, realistic relaxations that we have to uh, address. Uh, but with this kind of data, we can do epitope specific immune levels and it'll make a tremendous advance to that. Okay, next slide. Uh, uh, actually, I think that that's, that that's the last slide. So we'll, we'll open to questions. Let me add that uh, uh, in particular for expanding the model, but in building this one, we've been working with uh, Richard Salter at Oberlin and, and Wayne Getz at Berkeley, but we're especially eager to interact with some of the people at Mich young people at Michigan who'd like to work with us and, and, and build, look for grants and uh, sort of expand the horizons that we've had. Let me further elaborate on that. We are four, uh, 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 emeritus professors <laughs> and four emeritus professors can have more time to sit down and work together and they get excited in a, in a, in a pandemic period. But we need the, the, the younger people with more uh, 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 abilities uh, to write grants and to support grants. We, we really are looking for that. So, Again, uh, any questions, please type them in the question and answer boxes. And for me, I guess I'm just curious for what you've seen, like in the near future then, uh, okay, I, I, we just got a question on that, but let me fin finish my question. Uh, do you think that this would be like an influential model where you have to get a booster every year? Can, are you able to tell that right now? Yep. Uh, we are, uh, it's looking a bit likely, but we're not at the point where we can uh, uh, say that for sure. I mean, as I said, this is quite a bit different from influenza. The way the influenza uh, models work, by the way, is they don't uh, uh, look at the, the causal structure of, of what's leading to uh, uh, the escape mutations that, that uh, occur. And it doesn't even uh, look profoundly at the escape mutations. I think that this, this experience and this advance is going to change influenza. So that influenza is going to change to be handled more efficiently because of the, this kind of work that we're doing. Okay. And we have a question uh, from Walter Hill. This, uh, if I understand this model predicts second and third waves because of the variants, uh, we saw waves last year initially without variants. So does this mean we might see multiple waves with different costs, causes in the future? Hopefully the, the vaccine is gonna uh, uh, have enough uh, uh, effect beyond uh, the specific epitopes that it's uh, uh, designed to uh, uh, provide antibodies for and, and T cell responses for. Uh, uh, but uh, so, so that uh, that, but we will be getting more and more. And so, yes, 
I really believe that the vaccine will, will have, to, have to be changed. It, as I said, uh, uh, hopefully it's, it's going to be much more effective uh, uh, to be able to change. You know, the influenza vaccine is only giving us 30% efficacy in, in the older people as we're changing it every year. And it takes too long. I, I really think that we can keep this efficacy up to the 80 to 90% level with, with more rapid advances. Great. Um, thank you very much.